Hebrews chapter 10, once again, a continuation of what's already been, uh, he's been saying, and this, this is one giant conversation about Jesus being better than anything that the, the religions of this world has to offer. In particular, Jesus uh, coming out of, of course, the, the uh, lineage of the Jewish people and, of course, then the Jewish religion. Hebrews is a book that's reminding us that Jesus is better than the Jewish religion and its ordinances and the laws and all of the rituals, that we don't need that any longer. And this is his explanation of why we don't need those things anymore. And so in verse 1, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, or the law is only a shadow of the good things to come. Remember he talked about that in uh, chapter 8. He mentioned the shadow in verse 5, verse 4. For, for if he were on earth, Jesus, he would not be a priest since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. The copy and the shadow. In uh, Colossians, the Apostle Paul talked about how no one should judge us in regards to our religious worship or how we intend to worship the Lord. He said, because all of these things referring specifically to the traditions of the law or the, the things of the law were only the shadow, whereas the substance is Christ. So if, if there is the shadow, that the religion sort of reflects the shadow, but it's pointing, or it's, the shadow is being cast by something that stands be between the sun and, and the ground, if you will. And that, of course, is Christ. He's casting the shadow, is what the Apostle Paul is saying. And so the law is a shadow, but it's, it's telling us that there, it's more or less a preview of better things that are to come. Uh, they're not, the shadow is not the good things themselves, but it is the shadow of something better that is coming, and the something better that he's referring to, of course, is Jesus Christ, where the law having a shadow of the good things to come, and is not the very image of the things, not exactly what it is that heaven is. It's not the reality of heaven. It's only the religious part of it. And therefore, we can let that part go as we strive for the substance itself, who is Jesus Christ. Because a shadow can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach, perfect. So the shadow or the religious traditions or the religious rites that are offered year after year on behalf of the sinners and for their sins will not make the worshipers perfect or, or guilt-free. That's the problem. And that's the problem with the shadow. It just shows us that there is something there that needs to be seen clearer. And we can't see it yet because uh, we're just involved with the shadows of it, if that makes sense. And so these shadows can never, through sacrifices that we offer continually, is what he's saying in these religious rites of the Jewish faith, the Hebrew practices, year by year, make those who approach perfect for then or otherwise they would not have ceased to be offered or would they not have ceased to be offered meaning if it made them perfect as worshipers then why do they have to keep coming back they keep coming back and back and back they're constantly offering more because it leaves them imperfect and <coughs> since they were imperfect they had to continue to offer the animals for sacrifice for the worshipers once purified or washed, would have had no more consciousness of their sins. And they would be clean. They would feel the sense of relief that their sins had been forgiven. But they constantly had to come back. 
You know, it talks about the year-to-year sacrifice, but everyone would also be responsible, be responsible for bringing their own sacrifices for the things that they know that they have done wrong. Remember, we learned last week in last week's study that the priests offered the sacrifices for the sins of the people that were done in ignorance. They didn't realize they did it. But if you knew you did something wrong, then there was a sacrifice that you had to bring for that too. And so sin was constantly in their faces. And every time they'd go up to the temple to offer their sacrifice, the blood would be flowing down. It's constant reminder. Constant. And if that didn't cause a, a problem in them, then why, that's why they kept bringing these sacrifices. In verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, which creates, of course, the guilty conscience. That's what, he's, uh, that's what he said in verse 2. For then they would not have ceased, then they would not have ceased to be offered, then would they not have ceased to be offered for the worshipers once purified would have had no more consciousness of sins. But they did. They still had the awareness of their sin. And that meant that the religion, being a shadow, was just not complete enough. It was insufficient. Verse 4 tells us why. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. It is not possible for religion to make you right with God. That's exactly what that verse is saying. Absolutely not possible for our religious practices to make us right with God. Now, in the Jewish faith, you remember I explained this also last week, that they practiced the sacrifice of animals, which was just the kafar. Remember the kafar, or the covering, which was the IOU, which was a deferred payment. I owe you, and when I die, we'll, we'll straighten everything out. The problem is, is by that time, it's too late for the sinner. Even though he would have uh, offered sacrifices, the good news is that when you brought a sacrifice to God through the temple services or through the temple priests, if you came in with a right heart, of course God would receive that and he would honor that. But as we're going to see in the next chapter, that though there are many who died in faith without ever seeing the promises, without ever experiencing true forgiveness really in their lives, but they knew that there was an opportunity for them to have eternal life if they just continued to offer the sacrifices with a right heart. And then what would happen is they would go into the grave where they would descend into the lower parts of the earth to either the hot side or the comforting side. There was one that was uncomfortable and one that was very comfortable. And so if you died in faith, meaning you believed in the righteousness of God and that he would somehow make it all work out. King David was an example. Daniel, an example. None of these died in the faith that we understand. They died in a faith that God was righteous and so they came into a right relationship with God through that way. But they still weren't saved. They were just resting in what we've called Abraham's bosom, or some have called it paradise. They were resting in that place until Jesus came, died on the cross, descended into the lower parts of the earth, and then brought them up out of the earth and set them free. That's when the sin, their sins were forgiven. Until that time, it was the kofar, the covering, the deferred, the deferment. But they had to keep doing it. They had to keep doing it. They had to keep doing it. Every year, three times a year, it was constant. They had, they had to continue to pay their dues, so to speak, which is a, a relentless religious practice, a relentless religious experience. For it is not possible that these sacrifices, the blood of bulls and goats, could take away sin, can only cover it for a temporary period. Therefore, when he, Jesus, came into the world, he said, and he quotes from Psalm 40, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. Well, there you go. The sacrifices, the offerings, 
the religious uh, habits and traditions. That's not what God wanted. God didn't want that at all. He wanted purity of heart. He wanted sincerity, truth in the inner parts, not dead animals. That was, of course, what was necessary to show the people that a sacrifice was coming that would be sufficient for all. But in the meantime, you want to stay close to me, then this is the way you got to do it. That was the plan. But that was never the, the top desire. In sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Jesus' body. This was the body that was prepared for the one and only sacrifice that would take away the sins of the world. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. You see, people think that through religious service, through religious habits, through religious rituals, that somehow God is well pleased with us. No, that doesn't make Him happy with us. But what makes Him happy, as I have already said, is the rightness of heart. I'm not perfect, God, but I sure love you. And I want to I want to do right. I, I really want to do right. Even though I know I can't, I, I just want to be right with you. That is what gets God excited. That's why sinners like David can get God excited and God they can find favor in God's in God's sight. So can we. But it's even beyond that for us now. Then I said, Behold, I have come, this is my purpose, in the volume of the book it is written of me to come to do your will, O God. And this perfect sacrifice, the will of God, walking in the will of God, becomes the perfect and obedient sacrifice which was sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of bulls and goats was insufficient for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of Jesus Christ, who did the will of God perfectly, was the perfect offering all others were imperfect offerings so jesus becomes the perfect offering previously saying sacrifice and burnt offerings repeating it again a little paraphrase of psalm 40 previously saying sacrifice and offering burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire nor had pleasure in them which are offered according to the law these are just the shadows that it's not that they were wrong in themselves. They were right. It was the law. The law of God said, I want you to do this, and I want you to do it faithfully. And as they did it, they had to have understood or needed to understand, and that's why the author is writing this, though you did it, it didn't make you right with God. There's more to it than that. Something deeper. And so... Uh, he offered the sacrifices, they offered the sacrifices according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. In other words, because Jesus did the will of the Father, he takes away the first, the old law, that he may establish the second, or the new law, the new commandment, the new uh, covenant, the old covenant, the Old Testament law is now done away with because Jesus fulfilled it. The only one who's ever been able to walk in 100% fulfillment of the law of God. The only one. Which made him the one and only human sacrifice that would take away the sins of the world. No other blood was pure like his. And so he became the perfect offering. That he, so then he then established the second... Remember we talked about it in verse uh, uh, chapter 9 about the testament. Verse 16, for where there is a testament or a will, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator, the one who gives out the will, or the one who causes the will to happen. For the testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. So, so long as Jesus was walking the earth alive, he, the sins were not forgiven. It wasn't until he died that the second covenant kicked into play. By that will, in verse 10, he says, remember verse 9, he, I, I come to do your will. By that will, in verse 10, we have been sanctified, made holy, through the offering 
of his body, the body of Jesus Christ, and that once and for all. Not every year, three times a year, not every day if you want to. No, it's not necessary for us to bring an offering ever again. It is not necessary for us to practice any rituals, any rites. Remember, as Christians, we really only have two things that we need to, that we need to do as far as a ritual, if you will. Communion and baptism. That's it. Baptism once, communion as often as you do it. And the understanding, I believe, from the early church was once a year. We do it once a month because we like to, and according to Hebrews 11, we practice communion. It becomes an opportunity, in a sense, to, to give the gospel clearly and freely. And so we do it a little more often. Some people do it once a week. Others do it once a day. But I believe the tradition, the Christian tradition, would have been once per year. In the, commun- in the Passover meal. And that's would have been, that would have been the very first Christians would have practiced it in that way. But open it up to the Gentile world, they didn't celebrate Passover. And so whenever we wanted to do it, we were able to do it. And that's what Jesus said, as often as you do this, which leaves, leaves it wide open for whoever wants to do it. But anyway, then that of course symbolizes what we're talking about here in verse 10. And he became that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every time we partake of communion, we are reminded of that. Sanctified, sins are forgiven and you're made holy. That's what that's about. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Wow! Now I want you to think about this in the form of high religion. You know, the the high religious habits of the Jewish faith. How the robes, the, the pomp and the circumstance, all designed by God, of course, all brought in, this is how I want you to do it, because this is a shadow of the heavenly realm, and I want you to do it this way. And so they did it that way. But as we know, they kind of went off a little bit. They got themselves a little bit too uppity for themselves, believing themselves higher than they were, more righteous than they were, and everyone else was beneath them, and they started to have problems with pride. And now God had to kind of straighten things out for them. But every day these priests had to do their work. And as we know from the Old Testament, they had to constantly be ministering, meaning moving. They had to constantly be moving. No sitting down. That's the idea. The priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, almost like he says, for nothing really. It's just endless religious rituals. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. He sat down. The other priests had to keep going. Because it didn't do anything. And the more they worked, the harder they worked, the less was being accomplished. Because probably what was happening is after a while they go, these guys have come again, and now they're grumbling again. They gotta do I gotta kill another goat for this old goat. You know, I gotta go and help this guy. And so they their their service became maybe not the best kind of service. And yet, you know, this man Jesus after he offered a sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. It's finished. It's done. One time. Never necessary again. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. I love the picture of this uh, in, in the way I envision it in my head anyway. You know, you envision... He went and he did his job, which was to die on the cross at Calvary, to rise from the dead, come out of the grave, bring captivity with him out of uh, Sheol or out of Hades, and out they went into victory, into eternal life. And then he just sits back, puts his feet up, and just kind of just kicks back. And now he's waiting. I, f- I see that as our age our day, and the day in which we live, and, and the whole church age, go all the way back from the time of Christ until today, and up until the second coming of Christ. 
that church age. This is the period of Jesus waiting. Waiting for what? He tells us that he's waiting until his enemies are put at his feet. He, his enemies are put down. And until his enemies are put down, he's just going to wait. So we see things happening. We see violence happening. We see bad things happening all the time around us. And it frustrates us. We think, where is God? Well, he's done his part now. The, what, needs to be, what, what, what needs to be done now is for people to believe. And when people believe, they enter into the understanding of this spiritual world and what's going on around us. Evil is the result of the fallen world. It's a broken world because of sin. And Jesus is waiting for the right time when he can put all of his enemies that are causing all of this problem, which is the devil, of course, and more, he's going to put them all under his feet. Meaning, you think about it as, you know, he's going to put his foot on their necks and hold them down in submission and say, I win. And off you go. And, and so here is, a, 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 I think, a beautiful picture of his patience, but it, it may help us to have understanding as to why things appear to be so bad. Because his enemies are still running around. They're still running wild all over the world. They're causing problems. They're, they're, they're hurting people. They're killing people. They're hating people. They're... They're, they're uh, going to be put down eventually. But for now, people have to get saved. And that's where his patience comes in. He's ever patient, waiting for more people to come into the kingdom. For by one offering, verse 14, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified or being made holy or being set apart and so by his offering, his, his offering of his, himself, his own life, he has made the perfect sacrifice, and now those who believe are able to become holy and set apart, which is this work of sanctification. And it is through, of course, the Holy Spirit. In verse 15 he mentions the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us in that, uh, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord, when I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. Now this happens by the work of the Holy Spirit. And really, verse 16 is how sanctification actually works itself out in the Christian's life. The, the Word of God gets placed within us. And I don't think this is necessarily a one-time event. I think it's something that has to happen over time, meaning the more of the Scriptures that gets within us, the more victory we have over sin, our lives are changing, our thinking changes, we repent, and this is all a, an ongoing process. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. This is the new covenant, he said in verse 16, that I'm going to make with, with them after those days. I'm going to put my laws inside of them, in their hearts. So now this work of religious ritual, if you will, is not something you do on the outside. It comes from the inside, through the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. And so through the relationship the Spirit, with, the, with the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God forms Jesus inside of you by His work. And it's such a beautiful thing if we can accept it in that simple way. Then, verse 17, he adds, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Their sins and their lawless deeds. So, there's no longer the necessity to bring the animal sacrifices on such a regular basis because there's, he, God has not remembered our sins. Now, get this straight. Not that he has forgotten that you're sinners. He's not forgotten that. No, he chooses not to remember your sins. I will not remember your sins, he says. 
He knows the truth about us. He knows everything about us that there is to know. And so he has chosen not to let your sins be an issue for him because the Holy Spirit is in us, sanctifying us, and he's got it all under control. And it's not like we go out and we, we binge for a week and we think, oh my gosh, I've backslid, I've lost my salvation. No, no, no. You just go right back into, into where you were with the Holy Spirit and he cleans you up. He continues that work in you. You didn't surprise God in the least. God's not worried about where you went and what you did. It's already been taken care of and is being taken care of. And we'll see how that really works out as we continue with this chapter. And so this is the, the constant work of the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, he says, now where there is remission of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. In other words, he has, that where there is forgiveness, that's what remission is about. It's about your forgiveness of sins. Well, where your sins are forgiven, what do you need to offer anything for? There's no sin there anymore. He's forgiven your sin. And when there's, uh, there's no need for sin offerings any longer because your sins have been forgiven. Remission of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. So the whole ritualistic thing. Now keep in mind where, who he's talking to. These are Jewish people. They become Christians. And now they want to go back into the law. And he's going, what for? Your sins are washed away already. You don't have to do all that stuff. You don't have to impress anybody. Yeah, but all my neighbors are going and they're, they're bringing their goats and they're bringing their, their, their sheep. And you know, I feel like I should do the same thing. Well, if you want to, that's fine, but it doesn't do any. You, you already got everything you need. And he's trying to convince them of that. Let those things go. Now, there is, where there is remission of, of these things, of these sins, these lawless deeds, there's no longer need for the offering of sin because there's no longer need because your debt is forgiven. Where there is no debt, there is no need for sacrifice in the, in the religious mindset here. We have a different sort of debt in that we say, I owe Jesus everything. It's a whole, it comes from a whole different place. He's saved me. He's washed away my sins. Oh my gosh, take it all. Take it all, Lord. I'm all yours. Now I feel a, it's a different way. It's a devotion rather than a debt. Therefore, verse 19, therefore, brethren, therefore, remember, because your sins have been washed away, there's no need for sacrifices any longer. Therefore, brethren, you have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been granted unlimited access into the throne of grace. You can go in, go in, go in, go in anytime you want. I know you feel guilty. I know you feel ashamed. But he says, go in anyway and talk to the Lord and he will continue to cleanse you and wash you clean. Go in anyway. The blood of Jesus. You can go into the holiest. Remember the holy of holies. Remember the two compartments of the temple, of the tabernacle. There was the holy place and the most holy place, or the holy of holies. The holy of holies is where God met with the high priest once a year, and he met with no one else, just the high priest. Behind that veil, remember? Behind the veil. The other priests, they would mingle in the other part, and they would go in there as often as they had to to, to minister to the things of the Lord there. But the other side, no, 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 just the high priest only. But here he says, you can enter into that compartment now. And he's not talking about the shadow, because that would get him stoned. He was talking about the actual presence of where God is, or where Jesus Christ is seated. He's there. So through prayer, through our relationship to him, we enter that place anytime we want to, because the blood of Jesus Christ gives us permission. And we are able to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us, notice, through the veil. He penetrated the veil on our, on our behalf. What's more, he replaced the veil. Notice, that is his flesh. That he went through the veil for us, that is, through his flesh. Or, if you want to put it a different way, he became the door. 
Remember, Jesus said, I am the door. He became the door. Or if you want, this is an, an analogy that's been used before, a, a, a bridge. He became a bridge. The bridge, that, that veil used to separate the average person from the presence of God. Well, Jesus became the door into the presence of God or the bridge into a relationship with God. And having a high priest over the house of God, and remember the high priest was the only one who can go into that veil before, Jesus became better than the high priest. He opened the door permanently to us. He is now the high priest over the house of God, not the temple on earth, the temple in heaven. Let us draw near like, like kids. You know, kids have no uh, reservations when they see their parents. Kids just want to hug their parents. Uh, how, how many of you have uh, seen that with your kids? Or, you know, if you don't have kids, maybe you have a dog. And you come home from a long day at work, and they come, and oh, they're so happy to see you. That they, they jump on you, they, they lick you, they go crazy just to see you. That's sort of what we're, we're being told to do here. Just come in. Yeah, don't worry about what you've done. And, you know, if you've got dogs, you know they did something while you were gone. The kids, too. But here, it's like, don't just come in. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Confidence. Sincerity and confidence. Sincerity is big. That's what the true heart is about. It's sincerity. I come in. Lord, I know I'm messed up, but I know i got nowhere else to go. It's you and you alone, and that's where I'm coming. And then with assurance. Assurance meaning confidence. I have confidence that not only am I permitted into your presence, what's more, Lord, you want me in your presence. How about that? You want me here. Mud on my feet, dirt on my face, you want me here in your presence. That's why with full assurance, you're able to draw near. Notice, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience our bodies washed with pure water. Oh, the cleansing member, the baptisms, you know, well, yeah, you've been baptized. You got it. But your heart's sprinkled. That's what the high priest would do. He would take the blood from the sacrificed animals, go through the veil, and sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant and all around in there. Do you remember? Well, now he says, well, you are the Ark of the Covenant. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So you're sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ and you have permission to be in the Holy of Holies with your Savior. He wants you there. No matter what you've done, you've been sprinkled clean, washed, pure water. And now you see what he's doing. Again, here's the Hebrew salad. Let us draw near and let us Hold fast, in verse 23, the confession of our hope without wavering, meaning um, uh, you're, 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 you're not wobbling, you're, you're holding firm without wavering. You, you, don't have to, you don't have to let your knees buckle over this, this problem of sin because Jesus is working on it and he's on the job. He's already finished the job. So this is your confession your declaration of faith, this is your hope, and so don't waver from it. And the reason you don't need to waver is because He who promised is faithful. It's got nothing to do with you. He's faithful. He's faithful to keep His promises for you. And so you don't have to, you don't have to, to shrink back at what you know about yourself, because you're not surprising Jesus with anything. He already knows. And therefore, let us consider one another in order to incite or provoke love and good works. And these good works here means that you are affecting a moral change in people. Spiritually, yes, but it is the spiritual change that brings moral goodness. See, we often have it wrong, and especially the Christian church, when we start shouting, you know, 
You know, we need to put prayer back into schools, which I wish we could. We need to get the Bible back in schools, which I wish we could. But in a sense, the world doesn't want that, so we cannot make them morally good by our commands upon them. That would just make them religious. It has to come from the inside. It has to start within the heart. So we first deal with the spiritual fallenness of man and make them whole again through Jesus Christ. That puts the Holy Spirit inside of their lives, the the Word of God on their minds and on their hearts. They start to become different from the inside out. That's where our goodness is supposed to come from, from the inside. Meaning you're good because the Holy Spirit is in you, making you holy, making you gooder. Good, gooder. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, so let him do it. And then he says, not forsaking or abandoning the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. And the idea in context here. You know, you guys are struggling, he says, with your, with your conviction or with your, your confession of faith. You said that you wanted to, you know, to stay strong, you want to stay close to the Lord. But if you're abandoning other Christians, how do you expect to stay close to the Lord? It's almost impossible. In other words, he's saying if you're not fellowshipping, then you're probably going to struggle in your conviction and your commitment to the Lord. It's as simple as that. You hear people say this all the time. Well, you don't need to go to church to be a Christian. No, you're right. You can be a Christian, but you're probably not going to be a very good one. Because we need each other. We need each other. And this is what he's talking about. Do not abandon the, the assembling, the gathering together of ourselves. This is important. It's, and she says that's the habit or the manner of some to just stay home and not go. Now, you guys should feel okay because you're the choir. I'm preaching to the choir here. But there are others who don't come. Even sometimes we can make it a bad habit, especially in our world, of just saying, oh, I'm just going to watch it online. And that's perfectly okay at times, out of, out of necessity. But if you make that now your habit, or as he said here, the manner of some you may be getting the Word of God, which is very important, but you're missing the fellowship of believers, which is also important. Remember in Acts chapter 2, and verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, the breaking or prayer, and the breaking of bread. All of it is important. And then it says, the Lord added to the church. It, it is a combination of all of it. And so you can't say, well, at least I'm watching online. No, that's great that you're watching online. And if you're watching online, I'm glad you're watching online. But come to church. It's important for you. Come to church. That's the idea. Fellowship is very, very important. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That's some, uh, as is the manner of some. But exhort one another. Challenge one another. Even more so, so much the more, as you see or recognize that the day of the Lord is approaching. You see the day of the Lord coming, it's on top of us. Meaning this is no time for you to abandon Christian fellowship. This is no time for you to run the risk or put yourself at risk of slipping spiritually because the day of the Lord is approaching. This is a time, high time that we wake out of our sleep and and be ready to meet the Lord. That's what he's saying. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Tough verse, right? I mean, obviously what he's saying is, you know, after Jesus, there isn't anything else. There's nothing else after the Lord. If you think you're going to just continue to, you know, if you think you can go out and sin and say, oh, it's no big deal, I'll just bring a goat to this temple and just offer it. No, no, he says, it doesn't work like that. It's either Jesus or the goat isn't going to matter anymore. And to prove his point, this was pre-70 AD when this was written. And so at 70 AD, all sacrifice was wiped away. Gone, done. And still to this day, there are no animal sacrifices for temple worship. It's just 
non-existent for the Jewish people. They're trying to bring it back, but it won't do them any good. Only Jesus is, is sufficient to take away the sins of the world. So if you sin willfully or, or willful, di- willful disobedience, there's nothing left after Jesus. There no longer remains any other sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. And so what, what the author is saying is don't let go of Jesus. Don't give up your faith in Him. Because there isn't going to be anything else after that. No sacrifice you could possibly offer is going to make up for for your absence of Jesus. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. Wow. He's obviously talking about someone who knew the grace of God through Jesus Christ and has deliberately rejected it or turned away from it. Not a good idea. Wouldn't you agree? Just not a good idea. But obviously it's possible to do this. And where that puts uh, you, I'm not sure, but it hopefully gets you to realize, what am I thinking? What am I doing? Let's go back to the Lord. Let's go back to where I belong. And maybe you are listening online, and that's really what it's saying. Don't slip away. Don't let this... Don't let this this lifestyle of yours insult the the spirit of God's grace. Don't let that happen. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. You remember from Galatians chapter 6, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he shall also reap. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. If you sow to the Spirit, of course, you're going to reap the fruit and the blessings and everlasting life. And so that's the idea of these verses here. God will repay. He said, I will repay. And uh, it is the Lord who will judge His people. We're not going to judge. We don't have to judge. We shouldn't be judging in that sense. I mean, we should be able to tell what's right and what's wrong. We should be able to know when someone is walking rightly with the Lord. We should be able to see that. We should know that. But we we understand it at the same time. So judgment is not necessary. Prayer is necessary. Encouragement is necessary. Maybe, Maybe a little bit of a rebuke is necessary. And the sinner will probably think you're judging them, but it's coming from an attitude of love. In fact, that's what Galatians 6 also says. If you see a spiritual or brother overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual should go to that brother or that sister and gently correct them. You correct them. And it's not judgment if you're going there with the right spirit of love to bring them back into the faith. And that's this passage here is talking about that very thing. You remember he says in verse 32, I'm sorry, verse 31, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Yeah, you better believe it is. It's a fearful thing. Remember, uh, Jesus said not to fear the one who can kill your body and after that nothing else, but rather fear the one who after he kills your body can also kill your soul or cast your soul into eternal damnation. That's who you fear. You fear God is what Jesus was saying. Don't fear anyone else. You fear God. You fear what God thinks and that should be enough to tell us to behave ourselves in the spiritual life, in, in, in this life that we live. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but you'll recall the former days in which after you were illuminated. Illuminated? Is that enlightened? Illuminated? Is that something that happens to the person who becomes born again? Is that someone something that happens to the person who's had an, an image or a picture of the Lord in his life. But recall the former days in which you, after you were illuminate, illuminated, you 
endured a great struggle with sufferings, partly while you were made a spectacle, a public spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly why, while you became companions of those or helpers of those who were treated or persecuted. For you had compassion even on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. So what the author is here saying is that when you first came to Christ, you were willing to endure tribulation and suffering for your faith. When you came to Christ, you were willing to even give up uh, your time to help others who were going through persecution and, and trying to assist them. You were willing to give up financial, your, your own livelihood to help me in my troubles. You want all of that to be for nothing? You want all of that to go for nothing at all? He, he's saying, you, remember when Paul said in, um, oh, it was in Galatians, and he, he talked about uh, their um, uh, turning away, uh, chapter 3 of Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now trying to be made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? And the idea, of course, is if you've believed, then stick with it. Stay with the truth. Stay with this and, and don't give up. It's all going to be worth it in the end. And you'll see is what he's saying. And the reason, he says, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven, the reason you were able to endure it is because your eyes, was on, your eyes were on the prize. And the prize was heaven. And you kept seeing yourself there. You didn't think about what was going on here. It hurt. It was painful. But you kept saying, it's worth it because I'm going to heaven to be with Jesus. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. But somewhere along the line, he says, you're taking your eyes off of the prize. You're no longer seeing that as a value, and you're trying now to protect your skin. But he says in verse 35, do not cast away your faith, your confidence. Actually, the word confidence in the Greek here, it means courage. Don't cast away your courage because there's great reward. It has great reward. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You have need of endurance. Steadfast faithfulness or deliberate faithfulness. stick to -itiveness. You're sticking to it. You're going to hang in there no matter what. That's what endurance is all about. And he notice he says, after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promises. Not all rewards are designed for this earth. Sometimes we let our, or want ourselves to be comfortable, but Jesus never promised comfort until we get into heaven. That's where our comfort is promised. Jesus never promised us wealth. That was promised in heaven. Uh, uh, an inheritance beyond our imagination. But on this earth, we were promised tribulation, and trial, and suffering, and persecution, and hatred, all of that was promised us. And so we continue to serve the Lord and walk with the Lord because we believe He is worth it, and heaven is definitely worth it. And so we keep going. After you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not Terry. This is a paraphrase from Habakkuk chapter 2. In, in, in Habakkuk chapter 2, um, he talked about uh, the uh, vision. He, Habakkuk was complaining, you know, there's so much stuff going wrong. And he says, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, where I'm kind of looking, waiting for God to see 
what he would say to me. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that you may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Not now, but it's coming. But at the end it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry, it will not delay. Behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. That's what these these verses are saying. Verse 37, back in our text here. For yet a little while, and he, he was calling it the vision. But here, the author of Hebrews is saying, no, he who is coming will come and not tarry. He won't delay. Now the just shall live by faith. Wait a minute. He's saying Jesus said he was coming. We may not see the evidence of it, but it doesn't matter. He still said he was coming, so I'm going to live in faith that he's coming at any moment. That's how we live by faith. Not by the evidences that we see with our eyes, but by the promise that he wrote in his book. And so we believe the promise. But if anyone draws back, well, my soul has no pleasure in him. Well, of course not. Of course not. That's, that's perfectly logical and fair. Uh, how do you think my wife would feel if I went up to her and said, I love you, I want to marry you? And she says, okay, yes, I love you too, and I want to marry you too. But then, you know, a couple of weeks later, I say, yeah, I changed my mind. I think she'd be upset with that if you change your mind. That's, that's what it's talking about. If anyone draws back or changes their mind, well, I'm not going to be pleased with that. That's perfectly logical. God has every right to say, I'm not pleased with your decision to turn away from me. I don't like that decision. I don't like it at all. In fact, I think God has every right to say, it's a foolish decision. I am your life. I am your living water. Why would you turn away from me? It doesn't even make sense. So it makes perfect sense that God would say, if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those, or we don't belong to that group that do turn back to perdition or ruin or destruction or literally hell. What? We're not among the group that's, that's changed their mind and decides they want to go to hell. Whoa, that's, that's rough. But that's exactly what he's saying. But we belong to those who believe to the saving of the soul, the preservation, the saving, the preservation, or obtaining it, or the gaining of eternal life. The soul is going to live forever. And so that's who we belong to. We don't belong to this. We don't want to belong to the group that's going to, 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 to draw back. That's not who we want to be. So the advice is you stay close to the Lord, stay close to your brothers and sisters, stay close to the Word of God, and stay on fire for Jesus until He comes back. That's what he's talking about. Take everything else out. You don't need all of the rituals. You don't need all of the religion. You need relationship with Jesus Christ. And let us hold on until the end. That's, that's what this chapter is really talking about. A lot of words to say that, but as you see, this is a lot of stuff in here. So we did it. Lord, thank you for these words. Teach us more as we continue. As next week, of course, a huge chapter, the the hall of faith. I pray that you will speak to us again tonight as we go back and look over these notes and more reading more of this chapter. Teach us, Lord, about the necessity for endurance, that we would be courageous in our faith and endure to the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.